discuss in the discussion section, which will be on May 9th, and then your essays and response will be due at the final exam session, which will take place on May 16th. Uh, the essay format will be identical to that of the midterm. It will, however, require your knowledge of an explicit reference to the information contained in the semester's reading assignments. So be sure to finish those reading assignments and review them carefully in preparing for the exam, along with your lecture notes. Then on final exam day, which is Thursday, May 16th, and the exam period, by the way, starts at 5 o'clock rather than 4, for reasons that I've never completely understood, although they've been explained to me many times. But anyway, never mind about that. You have to come at 5 instead of 4. Uh, the second final exam will be administered in class, namely the identification of terms from that two-column list that we handed out at the beginning of the semester and which you have been quizzed on the left half of already. For the final exam, you'll be responsible to know, to be able to identify in a couple of sentences every term <coughs> on the list. Um, for the instructors and advisory committee members, we will be meeting this Thursday at 2, from 2 until 3.30. And then the instructors alone, Steve, are here now meeting to meet next Thursday as well at 2 to talk about uh, semester's end arrangements. Okay. Next? Yeah, uh, well, 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock next Thursday. So this Thursday at 2 and then next Thursday at 2. That is to say, advisory committee this Thursday and just the instructors next Thursday. Uh, next week, on the agenda is a panel of rescuers, or rather one rescuer and three liberators to complement our February, February panel of survivors. Um, these people are direct participants in the Holocaust and its aftermath. The three liberators are all ex-GIs from the U.S. Army, and the rescuer is an ex-policeman, a Dane from Copenhagen, who participated in various anti-Nazi activities in Denmark during the war including the famous evacuation of over 5,000 Jews in boats across the street of the neutral country of the uh, The liberators' names are Franklin Lyons, Vincent Tuminello, and Floyd Day. They will all be making their maiden appearance here in the Holocaust Lecture Series, but they come with glowing recommendations from the uh, Holocaust Center of Northern California in San Francisco, where last year they all participated in the 50-year commemoration of the liberation of the camps. Uh, the Danish rescuer, whose name is Knut Dyby, has spoken in the series here at least twice, probably more often than that previously, and he gives an account of his activities that is both humorous and inspiring, so don't miss it. This is uh, authentic first-person eyewitness stuff that uh, is among the most impressive um, material on Holocaust, Holocaust that is currently still available. This week, we are privileged to welcome back to the series my friend and colleague of the last Two and a half decades, Dr. Richard Paul from the Sonoma State Philosophy Department and the Center for Critical Thinking and Moral Critique. Um, he is the chair of the National Council for Excellence in Critical Thinking. He has written six books and over 100 articles on that topic, and has given lectures on critical thinking at many universities, including Harvard, University of Chicago, University of Illinois, Universities of Puerto Rico, Costa Rica, British Columbia, Toronto, and Amsterdam. Um, he has a bachelor's degree from Northern Illinois University and two masters and a PhD from UC Santa Barbara. Um, Dr. Paul's topic is rationality and genocide. And in his past presentations in the series, how many have they been? Three or four? Three. Uh, he has offered courageous, iconoclastic insights and challenges regarding our capacity to prevent personal and institutional violence by conscientiously applying our rational and moral powers to the often confusing, threatening phenomena that we face in the world, and I'm sure you know less today. Richard, welcome back to the Holocaust Lectures. Thank you. Thank you. sort of read through it briefly with you to set the stage for my remarks. Uh, I'd like to make this a, a little more interactive than uh, I usually make a, a lecture, but I think the topic 
not necessarily requires it, but will be enhanced by it. So in a way, if you look at the, the lead here, the question that I'm sort of putting to myself, and I'm going to suggest an answer to the question, which I think will probably not be a popular answer to the question, but I'd like you to entertain the notion that what is true has no necessary connection to what is popular. So that uh, a, a view might be quite unpopular if it be true, or uh, the reverse. So here's the question. Are normal functions of the human mind the cause of genocide and other assorted moral outrages? In other words, uh, the natural tendency, I think, in explaining the Holocaust is to refer to the abnormality of it, to see people who engage in who have engaged in acts around the Holocaust as being extreme, bizarre, sick, pathological, weird, uh, different from ordinary people. But I want to suggest that uh, we can explain and usefully explain the Holocaust not by reference to the weird, the bizarre, and the eccentric, but by reference to the normal. And if this is true, then there are very important moral implications that follow from it, among them being that people like you and I could easily have participated in the Holocaust. Uh, that we are not exempt from the mechanisms which enable the Nazis to participate in it. It would, it would therefore bring the Holocaust closer to the very structure of who and what we are uh, and I think most people try to distance themselves from it to suggest that what goes on in you and me, being normal human beings, is very different from what, what went on in the minds of those Germans who were with these outrageous acts. So the thesis of the interactive lecture is that genocide and other assorted morally outrageous acts perpetrated by humans are the byproducts of perfectly normal functions of the human mind. What are these functions? To form stereotypes, prejudices, and engage in self-deception is, I suggest to you, perfectly normal for humans. If you are a human, you have not only engaged in these in the past, you are producing or maintaining them. Because in your mind, you have stereotypes, in your mind, you have prejudices, and in your mind, you have constructed your normal human being, various things, mechanisms by which you delude yourself. Sometimes in very large ways, sometimes in smaller ways. And if I had the evidence to confront you personally, so if I selected you personally, and I had accumulated this evidence that showed that you had these prejudices, you had these stereotypes, and you were engaging in this self delusion, then I would predict engage in a number of what psychologists call defense mechanisms. Uh, you would choose between either denial uh, or rationalization. You would either deny that, the, that you had these prejudices, or you'd come up with, quote, good explanations why it was perfectly reasonable for you to have these prejudices and uh, to engage in this self delusion. That whatever else would be true of somebody else, you were justified. I'm suggesting that the human mind, in its normal function, is tailor made for re reality distorting behavior and and I'm arguing that it is these normal processes which open the door for a host of morally outrageous acts. How outrageous the act, I'm going to suggest, is not a function of additional mechanisms, but simply a function of the amount of power in the hands of the self-deceiver. <coughs> Something like this, little power, small outrageous acts. Big power, larger outrageous acts. The function the same, but the difference being the amount of power in the hands of the individual. Now, in relationship to this, I'm arguing that if you study the history of any nation or of any group, you'll see that every group has engaged in more like outrageous acts. Not as outrageous as the Holocaust in most cases, but in some, in a spectrum of outrage of moving into and that if you took a, a normal member of one of these groups and you faced them with the historical evidence that the group that they were a member of had engaged in this morally uh, reprehensible act, that most of them would be defensive, uh, would deny it, 
or would think of excuses that justify it. Why they were different. Why they were special. Why, historically speaking, it made sense. Why uh, they're not to be viewed as, these have to be viewed as outrageous. Uh, so if this is true, and of course it may be false, and if it's true, then the solution to the problem suggested by this is not in being normal, it's not in getting people who engaged in those acts or others who may be candidates to be more normal, but rather the solution is to become abnormal. In other words, I'm arguing that if we're to prevent morally outrageous acts from being part of what humans do, we have to become very abnormal. We have to make a kind of shift. Uh, I put it here in the fourth paragraph. It's not normal to be intellectually humble. It's not normal to be intellectually responsible. It's not normal to be intellectually honest. It is not normal to have a disciplined mind. It is not normal to be a rational. It's not normal to take charge of your thinking or to take charge of your life and to be responsible for your own acts. It's not normal to commit yourself to ethical principles. That is, ethical principles not supported by social indoctrination or by the belief that you have a pipeline to God. That is, what passes for moral action and action on the basis of moral principle, I think, is typically social conformity. In other words, a group, these are moral things to do. These are immoral things to do, and the vast majority of the people conform to their expected behavior. But if this is explained by social conformity, then it is not to be explained by moral principle. If you act on the basis of moral principle, then you can uh, uh, non-conform when your group violates moral principle. But if moral principle is equivalent to what your group believes is right and wrong, then you're following what is wrong is simply a matter of conformity. Okay, so what I'm arguing here is what is dangerous in us is not the exceptional or the unique or the bizarre or the weird or the inexplicable or the unintelligible, but what is dangerous in you and what is dangerous in me is that we have a normal human mind. And this mind left to itself is tailor-made for uh, the commit commission of morally outrageous. Now, to sort of get at the evidence for this, how could this be true or how could you test? Let's suppose you wanted to find out, is this true? How could you begin to assess it? Uh, well, here's one test which I suggest to you. Take a particular group, any group you want. Study a bit of the history of it. Could be the history of our country, could be the history of your religion, could be the history of your profession, if you're a member of a profession, and gather some evidence that this group engaged in some morally outrageous act. And then present that evidence to various members of the group and notice their reaction. My prediction is that you'll find denial and rationalization to be the major response, not outrage. So, for example, let's take our country. It's now pretty commonly admitted, but 20 years ago it wasn't, that the CIA engaged in a variety of moral acts in Argentina, in Guatemala, in El Salvador, in Haiti, and in various other countries in Latin America. And when the evidence that supported this was brought up, uh, let's say 20 years ago, the typical citizen said, baloney, that's radical propaganda. Americans wouldn't do that. The CIA, after all, is part of the American government. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't engage in such acts. Now, as the evidence comes out, and you can see it was in the Chronicle uh, a few weeks ago, where now the point is, okay, we did engage in these things, but we're not prepared to release all the data because there may be some people still around who might get into difficulty if the data came out. But here's my point. Now we're sort of admitting it, but nobody's outraged. Nobody's outraged. You can take it to your neighbor and present the evidence and say, hmm, that's too bad, isn't it? 
It isn't. How could we have done this? It's not a sense of outrage, but a sense of, well, there must have been some reason, and in many cases, the past, it's gone. The human mind naturally and easily rationalizes. Let's take, uh, let's look at it not from the point of view of nation, but so let's look at it from the point of view of religion. Because religion, I think, is very a mode of conformity rather than a mode of moral behavior. Because people, of course, join religions, and religions are a social group amongst other things. Now here, I have in hand uh, an early history of Britain written by David Hume. He wrote this in the uh, early part of the 18th century, and he's covering in this particular section that I want to read to you, one of the Crusades. In this day, in which, well, let me read from David Hume. The Crusaders had uh, been fighting battles all over the Middle East, and they're approaching Jerusalem now. And he says, the Sultan of Egypt, whose alliance they had hitherto courted, in other words, the Crusaders tried to get into a, an alliance with the Sultan of Egypt, recovered on the fall of Turkish power his former authority in Jerusalem. In other words, the Sultan now controlled Jerusalem. And he informed by his ambassadors that if they came disarmed to the city, they might now perform their religious vows, and that all Christian pilgrims who should thenceforth visit the Holy Sepulchre might expect the same treatment which they had ever received from his predecessors. In other words, come to us in peace, and you can visit your shrines, you can pray, you can do all those things that you say you want. Uh, the offer was rejected. The Soldan was required to yield up the city to the Christians, and he refused. The champions of the cross advanced to the siege of Jerusalem, which they regarded as the consummation of their labors. By the detachments which they had made and the disasters which they had undergone, they were diminished to the number of 20,000 foot and 1,500 corpses. <coughs> they started out at 700,000. So a huge number of people had died along with But these were still formidable from their valor, their experience, and the obedience which from past calamities they had learned to pay to their leaders. After a series of five weeks, they took Jerusalem by assault. And impelled by, and this is the important part, impelled by a mixture of military and religious rage, they put the numerous garrison and inhabitants to the sword without distinction. And the arms defended the valiant nor submission the timorous. No age or sex was spared. Infants on the breast were pierced by the same blow with their mothers who implored for mercy. Even a multitude to the number of 10,000 prisoners who had surrendered themselves and were promised quarter were butchered in cold blood by these ferocious conquerors. The streets of Jerusalem were covered with dead bodies. And the triumphant warriors, every enemy was a few to slaughter, immediately turned themselves with the sentiments of humiliation and contrition toward the Holy Sepulchre. They threw aside their arms, still streaming with blood. They advanced with reclined bodies and naked feet to the sacred monument. They sung anthems to their savior, who had there purchased their salvation by his death and agony. And their devotion, enlivened by the presence of the place where he had suffered, so overcame their fury, dissolved in tears, and bore the appearance of every soft and tender sentiment. So inconsistent now David Hume comments. So inconsistent is human nature with itself. And so easily does the most effeminate superstition alive, both with the most heroic courage and the fiercest barbarity. So let us assume for a moment that David Hume is correct in his historical account, and of course he may not be. But if he is, I think he gives an example of behavior that is perfectly consistent with human nature. On the one hand, these people in their minds thought of themselves as crusaders for God. They were on a holy crusade. They were going to find the place of the Savior 
and open it up for other Christians to come and worship. And they had an opportunity to do this with no death, with no suffering, but they chose rather to take it by force. And then they have an ovulation, and then having the slaughtered, they break. How is this possible? Are these abnormal people? My argument is no. This is perfectly normal human behavior. This is the way humans behave. When they can stereotype, when they can dehumanize in their mind a group, when they can take a group in their mind and put it up as this different kind of group, in this case it was heathens, pagans, can then behave in ways that are morally outrageous. Now, of course, no matter how outrageous this act is, it doesn't compare in any way with the Holocaust, except in its vital nature. Not in quantity, but in quality of thought. Because we often think of the guards at uh, Auschwitz or some other extermination camp. How could they do this? How could they go home and face their wife and daughter and pet their dog and engage in behavior that, that seems so normal and then go the next morning and observe morally outrageous acts. And what occurs, what I'm arguing, is the ability to do this, to separate their mind into two categories, one domain from another domain, and treat them by radically different ground rules is perfectly ordinary <coughs> human behavior. Uh, let me give you another example. There was an experiment done by a Yale social psychologist by the name of Stanley Milgram. Call the Milgram experiments now, and they're documented in a book entitled Obedience to Authority. Now, Milgram wanted to find out to what extent would ordinary Americans and other ordinary people, when under the guise of some authority, not significant authority, but some authority, how many would be outrageous things because the authority told them to do so? And so he devised this very remarkable experiment. He put an ad in the newspapers, in this case it was around the area of Yale, for citizens who wanted to volunteer to participate in a learning experiment at Yale. And his documented evidence showed that he got, he got professional people, he got teachers, he got lawyers, and he got blue collar workers. He got a good range of three people. And then when the person came in, there was another person, supposedly another volunteer there. The volunteer who was, the, the second volunteer was actually not a volunteer, but an actor. And then Milgram or his associate would come out in a uh, lab coat and say, we're, we're concerned with the effect of punishment on learning. And so one of you is going to be the teacher and one of you is going to be the learner. Let's flip a coin to see who will be the teacher, who will be the learner. But so that the actor was always the learner. Now, what Milgram then did was strap the learner into an electric chair and put the teacher at a shock board. And on the shock board, there was you know, a voltage going up. And in an area, it said dangerous. And the instructions were, as long as the learner gives the correct answer, no shock. But if they give an incorrect answer, give them five volts. Second incorrect answer, 10 volts. Third incorrect, 15, 20, 25. Just keep going up the shock board. Now the volunteer says, uh, I do have some heart trouble. Is this going to be dangerous? And the uh, the uh, the person in the lab coat says, well, it won't be dangerous, but there will be some pain involved. So now the experiment continues. And for a while, the actor gives all correct answers. Then he starts giving incorrect answers, and the shots start to come. And initially, the actor is going, oh. And then he starts to get louder. And after a while, he starts to scream. And he says, let me out. I don't want to participate in strapped into this electric chair. Now, the person who is the, the, the true volunteer inevitably turns to the person in the lab coat and says, he doesn't want to participate anymore. What should I do? And uh, the person in the lab coat says, 
continue. The experiment must continue. So now it continues, and the person stops responding at all, apparently unconscious. The volunteer now turns to the, to the person in authority and says, it's not responding anymore. What should I do? Consider no response or wrong answer. Continue to apply shots. Now here's the question. This experiment was described to psychologists before it was done. They were asked how many normal people, how many people go to the end of the shot. In other words, effectively, as far as I knew, applying a large voltage to an unconscious person who was simply a volunteer on the basis of nothing other than the authority of a lab coat, mind you, because they were going to lose their job if they could. Well, they predicted 5%, and they said the lunatic fringe. 5%, over 50%, 50% go to the end of the shock wave. In other words, half of you here would go to the end of the shock wave because the person in authority said the experiment must continue. In other words, the normal people would go ahead and do this. And what did they have to lose? Virtually nothing. And now take a circumstance where you have a lot to lose, where you're going to be rejected by the community, or you're going to be arrested, and you're going to be put in jail, or you're going to be mocked, or you're going to be whipped. How many people are still going to do the moral repair thing? And what, again, what the Milgram experiment suggested, by the way, this experiment was replicated in many countries around the world, and it was found that in Germany, 5% more went to the shock board. In other words, they're 5% more inclined to do this than Americans. Does that give you a feeling of consolation? To me, it indicates, again, evidence that it's the normal in the mind that is dangerous. Yes, there are bizarre, weird people. There are extreme pathologies out there. But these are, these are not the people who account for the vast majority of morally outrageous deeds, if this is correct. Let me suggest some other evidence. Look at Bosnia, a great example. The Serbs killed the Croats. The Croats killed the Serbs. Both of them killed the Muslims. Each group feels perfectly justified. Each group engages in morally outrageous acts, and each group feels it's not our fault. We didn't start it, or they did to us before. We must protect ourselves. That's their justification. What was the justification given by the CIA and those who worked with it for overthrowing governments, supporting right leaders? engaging in morally reprehensible acts, self-defense, the defense of the free world. So this, this argument that it's in self-defense that we do these morally outrageous things, and we have to do them to protect ourselves, is again perfectly normal. It is not unusual. Not the extreme group that says this, the normal group who says this. Consider Yeltsin in Chechnya. If you're for what's going on, we know that many civilians are being slaughtered in Chechnya. <coughs> but now Yeltsin is concerned about his election. <laughs> and now he may be willing to slaughter fewer people if it serves his election. Now suppose we sat him down and we said, look, these are morally outrageous acts. An election is insignificant in comparison to these lives being lost. What would he do? One, he would deny that there are the deaths being attributed, and secondly, he'd rationalize. He would do the normal thing. And in his own mind, he would sleep well. He would not feel great kinds of remorse. He would not be torn in his soul. He sleeps well. Political leaders sleep well. Even though they are every day sanctioning events that are morally outrageous. At one time, for example, the CIA supported an in, in Indonesia in which approximately 500,000 people died. And the CIA members presumably slept well, home to their families, and felt good they were defending the United States. Because these 500,000 were communists. Of 
course, these communists were men, women, and children. But they were communists. And so their death seemed reasonable to the people who engaged in them. Again, the argument is these are not abnormal people, these are not people. Uh, take historically the European treatment of Africans and Asians. There was a conference held in Africa. Uh, pardon me, held in Berlin about Africa, I believe the date is something like 1895, in which the whole of Africa was divided up between European nations. You get this, I get this, and you get that. The United States sat in. And what was the, impl the implication? Part of the implication was these people could be treated as territories of these governments, and therefore outsiders, the Europeans, could set the rules. Now, historians, I think, and argue that problems in Africa today are, in a significant measure, a product of, this, of these acts that were done by Western powers in the past. And so Europe, which many people, France and Germany and England, and England, which many people consider to be the heart of the, quote, civilized world, in the past engaged in morally outrageous. Yes. <clears throat> Our own treatment or acceptance of slavery, suppose you go back uh, and you take Jefferson and you take Washington and you take our great revolutionary leaders, who were in many ways, I don't deny it, great people, great humanitarians in some ways. Yes, all of them accepted. Why? Couldn't they see it? Wasn't the evidence before their eyes? When social conformity is strong, very few normal people can resist it. It takes an abnormal person to resist it. A person whose mind functions in a different way. Now, sort of stepping back from this, I want to suggest this as part of the explanation of why this is true. As humans, and our minds can shield distort reality. Let me put it this way. A kind of personal moral decision on your part, if this is true, you have this choice. Either you take charge of your thinking, or you're a normal person, and if you're a normal person, your thinking takes charge of you. Or if you run by your thinking. Your thinking makes your decisions. Your thinking makes judgments. Your thinking comes to conclusions. It's your thinking that's running you. But who's running your thinking? How much of your thinking comes from your father, your mother, your peer group, the media, the music you listen to? How much comes from you? How much of the thinking is really generated by you because you've thought it through carefully? And you're coming up with these beliefs because of conformity not because of the media, not because of self-interest, but simply because you thought it through well and you have the evidence to support it. I think that if you look at, again, human behavior, let me return, for example, to religion for a moment, where are most of the Christians? Where are most of the Buddhists? Where are most of the Muslims? They're in countries that are Christian or Buddhist, by definition. In other words, why not more Americans Buddhists? You might say, well, because there's better reason to be a Christian. They looked at the evidence and they've chosen the best religion. Now, I think that the only empirical hypothesis that makes sense is people choose their religion by the people around them. So if they're surrounded by Buddhists, they become a Buddhist. If they're surrounded by Muslims, they become a Muslim. If they're surrounded by Christians, they become a Christian. And this side, that's the best to be. That that is the chosen religion. That whatever happened to be the religion of the people around them was also the religion chosen by God. How can they do this? How can humans do this? Because we're self deceived Because that's a normal function of the human mind. To think in the following ways. Do you think this way? You're a normal person, you do. You have three standards for truth. 
It's true if I believe it. It's true if we believe it. It's true if I want to believe it. Now, how could you test this? Think about this for a moment. Why do you believe what you believe? Suppose you say something and I disagree with you. Isn't your mind going to say, he's wrong, I'm right? <coughs> Isn't the first move of your mind to wonder how I could be so prejudiced? How I could be so wrong? In other words, think how people agree and disagree. What leads them to say, I believe in this and I believe in that. As soon as you disagree with them, they'll say, you're wrong. Very few people will say, I may be wrong. You may be right. Very few people can really criticize the groups they're members of. How many lawyers question the American Bar Association? How many doctors question the AMA? How many people can dissent from their group and think independently? This is what I'm talking about here. So I'm suggesting these, these are the normal ways. Here are some abnormal ways to decide to believe. This is abnormal. To decide to believe because it's clear, because it's accurate, because it's relevant, because you've tested it deeply, because it's logical, this is very abnormal. People don't decide on the basis of these sorts of things. They consider this academic, not realistic. Now, let me suggest a kind of metaphor for looking at this. Look at your thinking for a moment as falling into two types. Let's call one kind of thinking green thinking. By green thinking, I mean the thinking that is spontaneous and that is impulsive, that occurs in your head automatically. And notice most of your thinking is automatic. That is, you don't have to try. You meet somebody, you don't have to try to judge them. You judge them. You get, you're in the situation, you're your mind sizes it up automatically. In fact, it would be very hard to keep your mind from sizing up the situation. This is green thinking. But often, I'm suggesting, ordinary, normal thinking is filled with garbage, nonsense, confusion, stereotypes, and prejudice. And when it's allowed to run our behavior, this leads, in certain circumstances, to into outrageous, morally outrageous acts. Now think of this. Imagine that you developed in your mind a capacity to do what I'm calling red thinking. What's red thinking? It's thinking about your thinking that forces your green thinking to be responsible. In other words, it catches your prejudices, it catches your stereotypes, and it stops you. You meet somebody, and your mind wants to he's a jerk. Now what's your evidence? He rubbed you the wrong way. You've known him for five minutes, and your mind already wants to say, he's a jerk. Not for five minutes, he rubbed me the wrong way, but he's a jerk. So your mind wants to leak on the evidence. And what is this? It's called prejudice, prejudge. Judge beyond the evidence. Judge without the evidence. This form of thinking, red thinking, we are disciplined self-correcting, probing, seek the truth. Do not accept our groups as determinant of the truth, of the truth. Able to make independent judgment. Seek clarity, seek precision, seek accuracy. This is not normal. This is very abnormal. If you become an educated person, you will be abnormal. Most people are not educated. Even people with degrees, are they educated? Are they seeking the truth, or are they conforming? Or do they have technical knowledge within one domain, and do they behave pretty much like their neighbors in the other domains of their life? So now I'm going to, I want to get you involved in this again. Uh, I'm going to ask you to test yourself here, and I'm going to give you a test to give to yourself. And then after you take the test, I'm going to tell you how to Okay. So here's the test. Here's the question. Do you regularly come to conclusions about people, for example, whether you like or dislike them, 
before you could reasonably say that you have the required information to legitimately judge them. If you think you never do this, give yourself a zero. If you rarely do it, give yourself a one. If you do it frequently, give yourself a nine or a 10. So how quick are you to judge the people you meet? Zero, I never prejudge them. I wait for all the evidence to come in. 10, I continually, obsessively prejudge them based on very little evidence, depending on how they rub me, circumstances in which I don't know. So I'd like you to think, or let's think about 30 seconds about yourself, think about your patterns, come up with your number, and then you're going to share it with somebody around you and explain why you think that, why you gave yourself. Zero to ten. Zero is almost never prejudge people. Ten, do it frequently, and you can give yourself any score in between. <coughs> okay, now those of you who are sort of sitting alone, look to your left or your right, and one of you moves so you're next to somebody, and if you're in a group of three, that's fine. Uh, share what you came up with and, and what you based it. How would you exercise?
Because all of them persons think they're different. In other words, to think, that you're, to think you're an individual and unique, you say, I'm not a normal person, I'm individual and I'm unique, that's perfectly normal to think that. To say, no, the normal functions of the human mind, I find them in myself. The normal prejudices of the human mind, I find them in myself. Stereotyping, I do it all the time. Prejudice, it's shot through my thinking. That's very exceptional. Almost no one will say that. And so if you say that of yourself, you are truly exceptional. And so the exceptional persons consider themselves normal. And the normal persons consider themselves exceptional. That's why the problem is normalcy. Do you see? Normalcy is the problem. Normalcy comes out as we are different. We are special. I am special. We are special. They, they're different. They're the bad guys. They're the people who engage in all of these sort of things. So what am I saying? I believe very much in education. Well, I don't believe education is easily achieved. I don't think it has any necessary connection to schooling. I think you can get a lot of degrees and be uneducated. For example, I've noticed this. On graduation day, the most common thing for students to say is, thank God it's over. <laughs> thank God I'll never have to read books like that or write papers like that or be in classes like that. And if you say that on graduation day, you are not what I would call a lifelong learner. You, would, you are called somebody who wants to retreat into normalcy. To simply keep your mind basically the way it is. You don't want to read books. Most Americans read very few books. The bookstore is not a proper place. And television is pitched for the intellectual age of 11. So if you're watching a lot of television, if you're older than 11, you're not getting stimulated. And we know how much Americans watch TV. So, what is education? As I view it, it's the ability and commitment to take charge of your own mind. And through taking charge of your own mind, to take charge of your life, of your values, of your beliefs, and of your moral integrity. You, you become intellectually humble, you realize you know there is a, therefore you seek knowledge. You become intellectually perseverant, you realize it's a struggle to learn and you're willing to engage in that struggle. You develop intellectual integrity because you see in your life contradictions everywhere, inconsistencies in your life, and you want to resolve those inconsistencies. You seek integrity. You realize that you conform. You don't want to be a conforming individual. You want to be an independent thinker. And because of these commitments, you become a lifelong learner. This is rare. This is abnormal. This is not this is going to set you off from the people around you, and they will consider you bizarre, strange, distorted, and you will be abnormal. So I hope all of you aspire from this day to become one of those abnormal persons. One of those persons who doesn't think that he or she is exceptional. One of those abnormal persons who recognizes that the very things that produce morally outrageous acts, the very functions of the mind, are working in your mind. And that if it wasn't for a chance and a happenstance, you might have been a member of the Nazi party. You might have been a guard at Auschwitz. You are capable of it. I am capable of it. My mind has that capacity. To recognize that it has the capacity is to be able to guard against that possibility. To deny that capacity is to open up the possibility to reality. Those are my remarks. Thank you very much.
feeling, thinking, normal, and acting. Um, yes. Very good question. Now, I'm taking your question to be looking at the relationship between these three. Thinking, feeling, wanting. The human mind does not simply think, it feels and it wants. And my understanding, as best I can make out, is that these are in a dynamic interrelationship, continually firing off themselves. So if I think this way, I'll feel this way, and I'll want this. For example, if I think that Jews are inferior, then I will look to them, and I will want to separate myself from them. If I think that they are undermining my well-being, I will feel that they are dangerous, and I will want to do something to suppress them. So I think that thinking, feeling, and wanting interrelate to each other in a dynamic way. Okay, and that, but that still doesn't mean asking on I think that this combination explains how we act. In other words, let's take the ordinary in the ordinary class. The ordinary student thinks that the class is a good use for them. They therefore feel bored. And therefore, they are not motivated to read independently or to get actively engaged in the course. Their <coughs> behavior perfectly reflects their thinking. In other words, if I could change your thinking, I would change your feelings automatically, what you wanted and how you behave. Give me just control over your thinking, and I say I control every dimension of your life. Therefore, if that's true, then if you can change your own thinking, you can reverse any, any pattern in your life. If you can control your thinking, which is a very big if. Other comments? Um, yes, John. Um, Richard, they, I might see and quite agree what you say, but I think where comes moral intelligence? Where does it fit in? Concern, compassion. Yes. And which, which may uh, not necessarily be based on intellect. So what I'm really talking about to attain a holy alliance between intellect and emotion. Mm -hmm. But without more intelligence, which fits someplace else into your scheme, yes. I don't know whether you know what is right and what is wrong. Yes, you're, John, you pointed out a missing part of this whole picture. And let me comment very briefly on it, but it's a big question. I believe that there is such a thing as moral principles in the universal. But the capacity to recognize them requires that you separate yourself from the social, conventional mores of your group. You must be able to separate what the group wants you to do, what the group approves of, and what is morally correct. For example, I think that it is that there is nothing morally reprehensible about walking in the nude around. That if you walk everywhere in the world, perfectly new, you'd be doing nothing morally wrong, in, in my view, by any moral principle that I know. But you would outrage people who have been taught that nudity is sinful, that it is disgusting, and that it is wrong, morally speaking. These people cannot separate the moral from the conventional. The conventional is the moral. So if you are going to understand moral principles, you must be educated enough to separate from social convention. And I don't think most people can do this. For them, what is moral is just what is conventional. And therefore, they are as likely to think that it's immoral to associate with a Jew if they happen to be in society that says that's wrong, and so forth. So the, sort of the stages of learning, as I'm viewing it, involve discovering moral principle by separating it out from the social and the conventional and other counterfeits as well. I think you can do it, you have to learn it. You still have it, but you need a frame of reference which you need to develop, and that's not that easy. Let me get Let me, let me not pursue that further at this point, just take a variety of questions. Bill? Well, I think I'm going to ask more or less the same question. Okay. Which sure. morality comes from convention? Where does true morality come from? Where do you find it? You separated yourself off from the conventional pressures and okay. you found your true moral uh, insights. Where, where, what, what realm do they stem from? I'll tell you the path that I think we need to take. I think we need to start with ordinary language 
and the terms in the language which name moral good and moral wrong separate from social convention. For example, take the word, the, the concept in the English language, cruelty. Cruelty. Now, it's true that different social groups will consider this or that cruel. So social convention made some society that whipping your children to death was not cruel because you had to inflict on them appropriate parental authority. But separate that out and ask yourself, what is it to be cruel? And now let me suggest the meaning that I think is implicit in this idea. To be cruel is to inflict unnecessary pain and suffering on an innocent person or creature, period. Now, that's what I suggest. Now, how can you test this? What you have to do, left on this principle, and say, does it seem to me morally intuitive that for anyone to inflict unnecessary pain and suffering on an innocent person or creature is moral wrong? So it's intuitive. It is intuitive when intuition is free from. What do you mean by innocent? What do I mean by innocent? This is another, this is another word. Let me give you an example because we have some examples here. Otherwise, we'll just go from abstraction to abstraction. Suppose what you're getting now by the limits of the language. Let me give an example. Suppose you say that you derive pleasure from torturing cats. You enjoy it. And I say, what has a cat ever done to you? And you say, what has that got to do with it? And I say, the cat is fully innocent. It's never harmed you. And you say, yeah, but I enjoy it. I would say you're more than If you not see that in some obvious sense this cat is innocent. You say, except the obvious. I'm saying that the concept of innocence is not, in general, moral innocence is not a subtle concept in its paradigm cases. Now, you can find difficult cases for any concept. Yes, what is your question? Um, what can students do to become educated? What can students do to become educated? Well, first, they have to begin to seek to understand things with their own mind. They must, they must believe that their own mind is capable of learning, and they must follow their own mind and watch out for all the pressure that's been formed to the other students around you, and to believe what other people believe. Yes? Yeah, I want to take a serious issue with a couple of points you've made. Go ahead. Um, the first one, when you talk about students in class who think they're bored, and you know, completely glad to be done with this and never want to read a book, you're putting your ability on the student. Yes. The responsibility isn't on the student. The responsibility is the teacher. The teacher is responsible to fire the student's imagination, to make them want to become a lifelong learner. For a teacher to say, I, you know, that's, that, that is the moral issue. I mean, you're, you're talking about how to get people to think. They don't think. You know, we know pretty well the way you learn to think is if you are taught to think. If you are, if you are in a, an environment that says, oh, why do you think like that? There is one thing which I believe I learned as an undergraduate, which I served me very well. It's this. I am responsible for my own learning. No one but me can learn what I learned. And that I should be able to learn from the most, quote, boring instruction you can imagine. That if my mind is open to learning, I can learn from a, quote, boring, dry text because I have this self domain Yeah, but you're not bored with that. No, definitely. Right? You have to be taught that. Just like you have to be taught intolerance, hatred, and prejudice, you get it by osmosis. So at the same time, when someone yeah. is getting it naturally by the society, there has to be someone else that says to you, well, maybe you should think about it like this. Okay, having indicated where I disagree with you, let me indicate where I agree with you. In my observation, if I go into third and fourth grade classes, and I do, because that's my work, I find that the students, you can ask almost any question, and this is what a typical third grader does. Call on me, call on me. And now when you go to the sixth grade class, you ask a question like this. <laughs> Why are you asking that? Is this going to be on the test? <laughs> Do we have to know this? 
Teachers are responsible for that having occurred. Teachers are responsible for the death of the mind at an early age. When you get to college, you are responsible for your learning. Right. At this point, you must no longer fob it off onto the professor. You must take responsibility for who and what you talk. Other comments? This side, I have heard no questions from what is happening. Is this out the right way <laughs> over here? Functioning in another way? A bunch of sixth graders. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. How effective have you been in your college experience in affecting a uh, more awakening in your students? I would give myself a D approximately. What was the question? The question is how effective have I been in stimulating the moral conscience of my students? And this e, is, I would say. This is in college? College. I would say I have not been very effective. I'm not following that, but I, mean, I think that's the fact. And I think this is what intrigues me. Why do students want to take charge of their minds? Why aren't they taking responsibility for their learning? Why aren't they going out there and saying, I can develop my mind? I want to develop my mind. Why aren't they? I don't know if I knew why. I would do something about it. Yes? I'm a middle school teacher. And um, I, I can truly, and, and I've taught, so I teach seventh and eighth grade. And I'm that I have these students for two years. Get them in seventh grade, then I get them in eighth grade. And I can say to you that any student in seventh and eighth grade that I've had will stop and reflect and think about whatever phenomena is in front of them. What, how they will act is another question. I, I think that the idea is to uh, confuse. The idea is to make you. The idea is to make you feel the student feel. Uh, like a dissonance. And then in that, they'll struggle and try to come to some kind of balance within themselves. But it can't be done in a lecture. It can't be done on a weekend. It can't be done in a six-week course. It has to be done every single day for, you know, an extended period of time where the teacher can make some impact on the student. You know, where there's a situation where I have you as a teacher for two years. I see you grade, and then I see you as an eighth grade for two years. Okay, I hear you, and I think you're making a good case for your view. Other views? <laughs> yes. I am a seventh grader, and I have never seen anyone in my whole life who is more impressed by his peers and less by his teachers <laughs> and his parents. <laughs> <laughs> but this is normal, isn't it? Right. This is normal. This is normal. This is what you see. But why? Well, you can look at it. I mean, part of the explanation isn't strange. We put children in a group of other children who think exactly like they do. And then they confirm each other. I mean, this is the problem with groups. They're homogeneous. And they get together. They seek out like. The light seeks out like. Liberals hang out with liberals. Conservatives hang out with conservatives. Liberals talk about how screwed up the conservatives are, and they all agree with each other. Conservatives talk about what the liberals are, and they all agree with each other. Men get together in the locker room, and they talk about how women are all screwed up, and they agree with each other. Then they go down to the eight ball saloon, and they celebrate. And women get together, and they discuss how men are screwed up, and they all agree with each other. See, this is part of the problem. We set people in these homogeneous groups, and then they reinforce. So part of what we need to do is give people dissenting views, dissenting from convention, dissenting from normalcy, and then hope we can get their mind alive to these possibilities. There's nothing more exciting than to take charge of your life, to take charge of your mind, not to be a creature of your group, but to be an independent and key person. To me, this is exciting. Why is it boring to so many people? Why isn't it something that inflames them? Why does a rock concert seem so significant? And a classic book, so boring. Why are great ideas not of interest? The library, the library, your piles of books, 
and nobody wants them. But if they were compact disks, they would be going like this. Why? The normal functions of the human mind. Yes? Can you hear that, Cliff? Yeah, I hear. I found thinking differently from the rest of the group very unsettling. Yeah. Very frightening. Yes. Yes, and this is one of the reasons because if we don't develop confidence in ourselves, or in our capacity to be independent, we will lean on the group. And the group will reward us for doing so. So if you tell people what they want to hear, they like you. If you question what they believe, and the more basically you question, the more strange and dangerous you seem. And therefore you then get separated. And you are punished for it, no matter what the group is. So we have to find some way to both be a society, but create as our social values independence of mind. To, re to re actually reward people who think differently. And not to simply reward people who agree with us and who go our own way. Follow up. Yes. You know, I have a bad mind and a difficulty in school because in order to get a good grade, you have to think either like the teacher or majority of the class. Yes, I think that's true. But let me give you an experience that I had in college many years ago. I took a course in Shakespeare. And my first paper was on Romeo and Juliet. And I argued that the top structure was weak because I argued it depended too much on chance. And I listed all the chance events that had a significant effect on the tragedy which occurred. And then I got my paper back. And I was written something like this. You reason very well for your views, but you are really nice. <laughs> Some feelings correlated with some thinking 
can conflict with other thinking correlated with other things. So you can have a conflict, for example, between your higher and your lower self. The part of you who wants to grow may do more at your head with the part of you that wants to conform. And both of those represent feelings, and both of them represent thinking, but conflicting systems. So whether that makes sense to you from your perspective, I don't know. But to me, it makes the best sense of who and what I am. Yes? Do you think that thinking come, has to come before feeling? Or the... That's chicken and egg. I, I don't think, see, if you said initially in an early infant, what came first, I think we probably have to say, if anything, wanting. Right? Wanting. But after a bit of time, these are firing so much against each other that I don't think you can any more order them. So how, if you take how somebody feels, let's say, about a certain kind of music, you'll find they also think a certain way about it, and they will want something as a result. So let's suppose they feel really good when it's music. They will think that it's fine music, and they will want to hear more. Now, which came first? I don't think it's worth pursuing. The crucial thing is that you can't change any one of these without the other two being influenced. I said, if I could control your thinking, I could control your feeling and your wanting. But if I could control your feeling, I could control your thinking and your wanting. And if I could control your wanting, I could control your feeling and your thinking. Why then do I emphasize thinking? Because that is the leverage point. I mean, suppose I came into class and I said, stop feeling this. Feel this. Could you do it? You can only feel what you feel. But you can think what you don't think. You can try out thoughts that are strangers to you. You can role play a thought. It's hard to role play a feeling. So I suppose I said, hate this group for a while. Try it out. You can't, but I say, think of them this way. Then you can. So what I'm saying is they're equally important. No one of these should be put ahead of the other. But where is our leverage? I say our leverage is here. Our leverage is not, I can't give you my feelings, I can't give you my wanting, but I can give you my thinking. And you can think it. Even if you despise it, you would still think it. If you were open-minded, you could say, I find these views repugnant, yet I will think them in order to examine and see perhaps they're clear. This you can do. So if I'm correct, there's a reason to emphasize thinking. There's a reason why we don't have schools of feeling and schools of wanting, but where we do have schools of thinking. Final questions, comments, yes. Um, the whistle, according to the corporate whistleblower, is an abnormal person, yes, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. He's taking risk of losing his job. Yes. But he's speaking out. He's willing to take that risk. I still can't see how these three end up in action, and I'm talking about... Gee, I can't see action. how they couldn't end up in action. Because let's suppose, let's be the, the corporate whistleblower, and uh, let's suppose I'm thinking that this corporation, let's suppose they're producing a chemical that is very dangerous, and they're marketing it as if it's not dangerous. Okay? That happens. You feel morally outraged. <coughs> People are going to get cancer. You want to do something about it, and you blow the whistle. Okay. And you go out there, and you lose your job. Okay. I think that makes perfect sense. OK, but then suppose you get so angry because you've lost your job, and you want to kill someone, <laughs> and you don't do yes. that. That is what where I'm drawing the line, that you may think and feel and want to do something immoral in terms. The whistleblower, to me, is immoral if they're not selfishly motivated. Okay, we're assuming that. Yes. But then feeling that this was really bad and going out to shoot somebody because you lost your job, that to me is, is the action part that I'm questioning. But I would come back. Take the thinking of this person. How dare they fire me? How dare they do this to me? They deserve the supreme penalty of death. And feel hatred for these people. And you get yourself 
Well, you're gone for a lot of courtesy of the American Rifle Association. And you march down there and you blow them apart. And you feel perfectly justified in doing it. It seems to me that's 